Welcome to this afternoon's Eng1003 lecture. Uh, just doing an audio check. Wonderful. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, I'll make it five for the hour. I'll um, turn the audio off for five minutes and we will start at four o'clock. See you shortly. Just doing a second audio check. Is that volume a bit better? Great. Not too loud? All good? That's great. Thanks. Yeah, I adjusted the, I adjusted the volume here manually, but sounds good. See you in four minutes. Thank you.
Okay, I make it four o'clock. Shall we get started? Um, just one final audio check to see if those levels are okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just drop out of Discord for the moment. Might come back later, we'll see. Okay, look, welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, uh, in, important lecture as they all are, but uh, the, this, this, this one, uh, lectures, today's lecture is a little bit a little bit different to the ones we've been um, seeing so far, uh, because there are two topics for today's lecture. One is to review some important content that we presented at Monday's lecture, and also to give an overview uh, of style and content for the assessed lab next week in week four. And these two things are related to each other because uh, the lecture content that we presented on Monday's lecture um, will form a part of, not all of, but a part of um, the assessed lab the next week. Now I'm conscious that uh, of a couple of things. One is that in Monday's lecture, we covered some really core material. And um, that means it's not always um, the sort of material that sinks in straight away. It often takes a little while, a little bit of practice to get your head around. And so uh, most of today's lecture actually is going to be in some sense, a review of Monday's lecture. No, no new content in today's lecture. What I wanna do is work through with you live through five or six problems of increasing uh, difficulty um, that use the concepts that were first presented in Monday's lecture. And they have to do with branching and looping. And then towards the end of today's lecture, we'll talk about um, the week four assessed lab, both the content that you can anticipate in that lab and a little bit about the style and um, the, the nature of, of, the, of the assessed material. So um, at this point, it's probably worth a, a reminder that the assessed lab next week contributes uh, up to 5% of your overall course grade. 5% of your overall course grade. Um, so it's definitely worth um, putting effort into. On the other hand, um, I, it's not worth getting over anxious about. It's it's just our first check of how you're going with the content um, that we've seen in the first three weeks of um, of semester. And just a reminder, if you're listening online that we're doing the Q&A on the Discord server in the questions lectures channel. So Monday's lecture, we looked at two major concepts listed here under three dot points. The first concept was the idea of um, branching. I've actually presented them here in the opposite order that we did in Monday's lecture, but there's no uh, implied significance there. Branching. That's the first time we've seen the ability to have blocks of code that are executed or not executed, depending on the value of a condition that's checked in the program as it operates. So conditional execution of code blocks, and we looked at three different types of them, and they're all, they all come under the same family. And we're gonna review some of those families today. I've listed them there, the if, if else, and this if, else, if, else. A bit of a mouthful, but I'll, what I wanna do is rather than talk about principles, I wanna show it to you in practice live using PyCharm in just a few minutes. Then the second major idea we looked at on Monday's lecture was the idea of iteration, getting Python to do tasks iteratively over and over again. Um, and there were two variants on that iteration. The first was to use what's known as a for loop. So we're using a fixed number of iterations. And the second is to use what's known as a while loop, which keeps iterating until a particular logical condition is satisfied. And we gave those logical conditions, we also called them a Boolean conditions. So let's jump into it. We're going to start with the topic that we finished with on Monday's lecture, which is conditional execution in the form of branching and the simplest form of the branching statement, which is an if statement. So to demonstrate that, we're going to write live using PyCharm. Um, we're going to write a Python program, which is required to satisfy the following behavior. We're going to take an integer that's drawn from the set one, two, three, four, five, and six. 
you can think of it, if you like, as rolling a dice or a die, um, and one of six faces will come up. And uh, depending on which number's displayed on the, on the dice, um, depends on which message is displayed. And so if the number one comes up, we want to display a message, you win a prize. If the numbers two, three, four, five, six come up, we want no message to be displayed. So we're going to write some Python code, which um, which does that for us. Just make the screen bigger for us. Okay. We're going to write a program, which just as a reminder, takes an integer between one and six and displays a message. Now for this code, I'm gonna type in, that give the value to the variable n in the code. You can imagine if you're rolling a dice that what you'd like to do is have a random number generated that generates a number that's either one, two, three, four, five, and six. We haven't seen random numbers yet in Python. We'll do that next week sometime. So for the moment, we'll just introduce an integer, uh, ver an integer variable, we'll call that n and give it the value one. Now we wanted the program to have the, have the behavior that if the number one is displayed, we want to say win a prize, and if the numbers two, three, four, and five, and six is, is the value of n, we want no message to be displayed. So there's there's a condition going on here. So we we can write code that says if n is equal to one, remember the double equals sign? That's a way of saying, that's a way of establishing the logical equivalence or the, or the value of, it's basically saying, does n currently have the value of one? So a double equals is different to a single equals. A single equals is an assignment. Double equals is um, um, an equality check. So if n is equal to one, we want to display a message and we want the message to be displayed. Um, you win a prize. Now, if you look carefully in the editor, you'll see this little red squiggle after the number one. That's the editor's way of saying there's an error in the code. Do you remember what the, the syntax is need to be to finish off a, a, an if statement? It was a colon. Always need those colons at the end of the lines to indicate that we've been a prize. And we're finished, that's our code. N is equal to one. If we if we run that program, let's run that program. Example one, you win a prize, and there's the message displayed on the output on the console there. On the output. Let's go back to our program. Uh, Sorry. Here's our program. We saved it, what we call it. Okay, let's go back to presentation mode. That's not a complete test of our code. We're not gonna have a complete test, but let's, ha let's see what happens if we change the code now to n equals two. So the variable, it's like we roll a dice and the number two comes up. What should happen when that program runs? Our program specification says that no message should be displayed. So let's run it again. And you see here, there's no message to say we've won a prize. So that's consistent with the correct operation of the, of the program. Let's go back and check n equals three now. Let's run it again. N equals three, no message again. So good, we're consistent with the with the specification because the number n is not equal to one. Let's change it back to one just to double check that the program does in fact run correctly. 
we run it again, we win a prize. So that is the simplest example of conditional execution. It's the use of the if statement. And what we can do is remember that we terminate the if statement or what the conditional code by uh, using indentation. And if we put another statement like print hello here, change that number to two, what's gonna happen when I run that code? It won't display the first message, but it will display hello because the hello is not indented. So let's run it again. There we go. So it's the, the conditional, the statement if is, a, is equal to one only applies to this statement that print you win a prize because of the indentation. And as soon as we drop the indentation, we're outside the execution, the conditional loop and uh, the, the, the rest of the code continues. In this case, print hello. Now that wasn't part of the problem specification. So let's um, change this back to one, run it again. We win a prize, fantastic. That's our first example um, illustrated. For, that was our first example, the use of the if statement. Really handy to be able to execute some code depending on a condition. In this case, it was the, the Boolean condition uh, and being equal to one. Um, I've got a screenshot here that's just as a reminder of the code that we demonstrated. This is being done live rather than pre-cooked. So there you go, it's in the notes. Let's look at example two, a bit more complicated this one. The problem specification is more complicated. And so the code will also be more complicated. This time we need to write a program which takes an integer, again, one through six, and displays a message. If n is equal to one, we say we've, we've won first prize. If n is equal to two, we display you win second prize. And if n is equal to three, four, five, six, we display a message which says, sorry, no prize. The simple condition um, statement uh, could be used. We could use a sequence of three of them to solve this problem, but we're gonna use a different method. We're gonna use the if, elif, else um, construct that's shown on the top of page six. So let's do that now, let's write our code. So we're gonna start a new uh, a new program. We're going to start example two. So now we've got a, a fresh, a fresh, um, fresh screen. Um, let's set n is equal to one to start with. We'll come back and edit that. Um, you could also write, an, you could, this could, and be, could be a program where you write n and you seek input from the console rather than having to jump back into the program and edit it. You, so you could use the input function. We won't do that here. I wanna focus on the, the conditional code. So if n is equal to one, the problem specification was that we displayed the message, you win first prize. Okay, n is equal to one, indentation, print, you win first prize. Great. So if that's the first part of the solution, the second part of the program is to see if, if n takes the value two, we wanna display you win second prize. Okay, so we can, so it's different from the first condition. So n is not equal to one, so it drops down to the next line and it checks, L, remember L if is short for else if. So if n is equal to one, do something else, meaning if that's not, if that first condition's not satisfied, we need to display a second message. So we print and the message was you win second prize. Great. And the problem specification 
then is that if n's equal to three, four, five, or six, we display sorry, no prize. So else, the else also needs a colon at the end. And see that the editor is really helping us here. We type the word, we type the keyword else, and there's a red squiggle there. We need to put a colon in, and then it says, and the Python editor says, aha, I know what you mean. It's an if, elif, else um, construct. So now we print the third message, which was, sorry, no prize. And we're good to go. Let's give that a run. What's going to happen now with the code set up in the way that it is now? Because n is equal to one, the first condition will be satisfied and we should, we hopefully see the message you in for it flows prize expect. So let's do that. There we go, great. M was equal to one, so the message was displayed, you win first prize, meaning that this line of the conditional statement was executed. If we change N to two now and run again, we get a message which says you win second prize, which, is, which means that this line of the code has been conditionally executed. If we change, n to the value three now, is n equal to one? No, else check n is equal to two. No, else print, sorry, no prize. So when we, when we run this code, we would anticipate sorry, no prize. And if we want to exhaustively check, we could change n equals four, Run the program again. Sorry, no prize. N equals five. Run the program again. Sorry, no prize. Change N to six. Run. Sorry, no prize. So at least for integer values of N, one, two, three, four, five, six, we've exhaustively tested our program. There are other ways of solving this problem. Um, Let's see if we can do one on the fly. An alternative solution is this. Instead of this construct, we could have used this one. This should also work. Haven't tested this one, so let's go live and let's run it. What's the value of n? We'll set it to one. First prize, excellent. N is equal to two. Let's run it again. You win second prize. If N is equal to three, we run the program. Sorry, no prize. Yep. So a couple of more general points come out of this particular example. Conditional execution, there's usually more than one way of writing the solution. That's often the way in computer programs. It, there's often more than one solution. Um, the other thing is that the, this logical condition down the bottom is able to be written out explicitly, which identifies the, the different conditions which under which the sorry no prize message is displayed, and it's equal to three, four, five, or six. I would argue that the first solution was a simpler one because we didn't have to write out all these different these different numbers. Imagine if we had an exercise where we were rolling not one dice, but two in which case there would be 36 different possibilities depending on, um, or up to 36, depending on how we wanted to um, count pairs of, uh, pairs of dice. So there's multiple ways of solving a problem. We've just sh shown a couple of different ways um, with this, with conditional execution. Um, and again, um, on page seven there, you see um, some Python code and some output for that example. Um, that'll hopefully um, start to bed down some of the, the ideas that we saw towards the end of Monday's lecture on, on conditional code execution. Um, you will see, and we will see through the remainder of the course, right through to the end, um, conditional code execution branching 
is one of the most common themes in, um, in, in programming. So we will probably literally see it in some form um, every week, every lecture uh, from here till the end of semester. It's a very common uh, element of, of most um, programs that are anything other than a few lines long is conditional code execution. Let's now move to um, not conditional code execution, but iteration. And there are two forms of uh, iteration that Python supports. One is a for loop, one is a while loop. And the for loop uses uh, a fixed number of iterations. The while loop continues to execute until a condition is not satisfied or a condition is satisfied. So let's start simple. And this simple example is gonna carry us through for the, next, for the next few examples. So our Python program needs to use a for loop to print the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 to the console. And the advice is that our program should use the basic form of the for loop. So in the loop header, we should use this construct of a, of a, of a list of numbers and actually write out explicitly what the, what the uh, loop indices need to be. So let's do that. Let's give ourselves a new file and let's call it example three, starting from scratch. The syntax for a for loop is for i in, in this case, we're asked to use the, the simple form one, comma two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Notice the little red squiggle at the end of the line. That's a little prompt to remind us we need a colon at the end of the, to terminate the, the for loop header. And the problem specification, let me just bring it up for you, is that it should simply print the numbers one through 10 to the console. That's all it needs to do. That's all it needs to do. So a simple statement like print I will, will, will do it for us. Let's run that code now. Example three, and we run it, and there we have, it's written the numbers one through 10 to the console. We're done. Couple of things to notice. One is, let me bring up something at the end. If I run this code now, and I've just added a line print finished. How many times is the message print finished going to be displayed? One time, 10 times, some different number. It'll just be displayed once and it'll happen after the integers one through 10 have been displayed. It'll only happen once because it's not indented unlike this print statement here. Remember, after we've set the for loop up with a header, anything that's indented will occur iteratively for as many times as the loop counter takes to work through its list. So let's run this code now. And we see that it prints the numbers one through 10 to this, to this console and then prints the, the message finished. So that was one thing I wanted to illustrate. That wasn't part of the problem specification. So let me remove that from our code. The other thing I want to point out to you, because I want to draw, I want to use it to show you um, a, a way, one way in which for loops are different to while loops, is that in a for loop, Python automatically takes care of the fact that the in, the index needs to increment each time. That's not true in a in a while loop. We'll need to do that manually, but let's we'll look at that in a second. So there's no action we need to take. All the code that's indented gets executed for as the as the loop index runs over the the set of indices, and there's no explicit incrementation needed of the of the of the loop variable. Now the the, the beauty of a of a of, of this explicit list here is that we can do something like we can drop out a number here and run the code again. So what I've done is I've just removed the number nine from the list. So now it says for y equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, omitting nine. And if we run it, 
they're the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, omitting nine, and then 10 get displayed. So that's one of the nice things about this, this form of the for loop. It's a little bit clumsy to have to write in all the numbers one after another, but we've got complete control over what goes in that list. In fact, we could even make it a number that's different from an integer and run it. And it displays that floating point number that float. So that's pretty nice. Um, it's very flexible, this form of the, um, the for loop. So we've solved example three. We've written the Python program, which uses a for loop to print the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten to this to the console. And we've we've complied with the instructions that, that should use the basic form of the for loop in the loop here to use the, the, the numbers explicitly. So what's the next example we need to we need to do? Example four. Modify our solution to example three to use a for loop to print the squares of the numbers to the console. And we're asked to use the following display format. We, we need to write them in the form that you see here. One star star two. Remember, star star is Python's syntax for exponentiation. So that, that's another way of writing one to the power two. Two to the power two, three to the power two, four to the power two, and so on. And we need to continue that up to 10 to the power two. So let's do that. Let's make life easy for ourselves and uh, use the same code. It says modify our solution. So we could start with this. Let's run that code. Okay, it produced the numbers 1, 4, 9, 16, and so on up to 100. That doesn't satisfy the full specification of our program. Why? Because we needed to display the output in a particular format. But still, it was a handy step to be able to make just one small change to our program and confirm that, in fact, we did, in fact, have the syntax right for squaring a number in Python. So that what you see there on the screen now is not a complete solution, but it's a step towards the solution. So what we needed to do was write code that specified the, the output in this format. So let's do that. We need a more, we need a more um, complicated print statement. So we're going to print number placeholder star star two, meaning raised to the sec raised to the two power square is equal to placeholder. And then we need to print two numbers, the first of which is the loop index, the second which is the square of the loop index, and then we need to complete the print statement. Remember we've seen these placeholders a couple of times now, and the first one corresponds to the loop index, the second placeholder corresponds to the to square of the loop index, so we're getting Python to do the computations for us, and the star star two is part of the string that we want to display to the, to the console. So let's run our program now. And there we have the solution. We have the output displayed in the format that followed the required format. So in fact, that is a complete solution to uh, example four. We've got a, a for loop and we've got a, a formatted output. So we've solved, we've, 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 um, we're making good progress. We've solved example four. Let's push on. Example five, modify your solution to example four to use a for loop to print the squares of the numbers one, two, three, up to a thousand, not 10, but a thousand. And we need to use the same display format that we used in the previous example. But this time the specification is different. It says we must use the range function in the for loop header. So we need to think back and look back at our notes maybe and look at the, the, the syntax of the range function. And the reason we need to do that is that because if we're going to have a, a, a for loop which runs over the indices one to a thousand, I'm not about to sit here and type the numbers for i equals one, for i equals, for i in 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, 998, 999, 1,000. I'm not going to do that. We're going to ask Python to generate those indices for us, in which case we need to use this, or we can use this range function. So let's, let's do that now. So first, what I'm going to do is replace that explicit list here, highlighted in blue. I'm going to replace that with the range function. Now, you can look back to your notes to Monday's lecture if you like, but the range function has three arguments. The first is the starting index. The second's got something to do with the, the final index. I'll come back to that number in a second. And the third number is the increment, incrementing from one to two by three by, by a step of one each time. So if we run that program, produces the number which is which is great it's actually just done a very large number of iterations each one printing a message to the screen but can you see the problem the last index that was printed was not a thousand as we'd specified in the argument the second argument to the range function but 999 so the range function's got this funny thing in that we specify the number that we want to stop before we reach 1,001, namely to get to 1,000. So I deliberately put 1,000 in the first time to show you what happens and you get an error. A message from me at this point is that, do I expect you to be able to memorize the, the arguments to the range function? No, you can look them up if you need them. You can also experiment and do what I just did there and just have a guess. Is that going to work? No, you need this one. So let's run the program again. Example three, and there we go. It's got the required format. It goes right down to a thousand squared being a million. And we've just done that um, very efficiently by getting Python to generate the indices one through a thousand rather than explicitly type them, type them out. I had in mind there was something else I wanted to use. Oh, yeah, this is not part of the problem specification, but this third argument, this is the one, this is the step by which I is incremented each pass of the loop. So let's, for fun, let's just increment that to two. Think about now what the display is going to do. Now the increments, it starts at one and it goes up by steps of two instead of, instead of one. So if we run this program now, it prints the squares of the odd numbers from one and less than, a, no, no more than a thousand. We could, if we wanted to display the squares of the even numbers, we could start at index two, run the program, and it would produce the squares of the even numbers, no more than 1000. We could also start at one and go up in steps of five, and here you see the indices jumping up by five at a time. And, 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 and you, you see the pattern there. So uh, another message from me is that um, you should feel free. I'd encourage you when, you, when, you, when you're studying, when you're answering uh, some of the lab sheet questions, have an experiment with some of the arguments to these, to these um, built-in or external functions. You won't do any damage and you might learn something along the way um, about about how the functions operate. Much better to see it with your own eyes than read about it in a book, for example. Good, example five. Example six, it's actually our final example. Okay, example six, write a Python program which calculates the sum of the squares of the first n integers. So that's equal to one squared plus two squared plus three squared and so on up to n squared. Okay, we've got to add those up somehow. We need to use a while loop. So far we've been using four loops, so we need to use a while loop. We then need to demonstrate that the program um, operates for n equals 10. 
And the third dot point there is we need to check our answers correct using a formula which is given to us. So let me say, let me be clear. I don't expect you to know where that formula has come from. I don't expect you to have seen that formula before. You certainly don't have to derive it. I'm giving it to you. And what it does, it's an alternative expression for this one that we're going to compute with Python. And it's really nice when you when you when you're testing and verifying that code works that you've got something to compare your output with. And in this case, I'm giving you the formula. Now, I've deliberately made this example six significantly um, more, well, it's more complicated than any of the examples we've seen here today. So we need a strategy. And my advice to you, it's the advice I followed when I first solved this problem, and then I'm going to show you live online how we do it. I don't try and solve the whole problem in, in the first go. I try and solve the problem one baby step at a time. And the first baby step I'm going to take to solving this problem is simply using a while loop to print the numbers one through n on the console. So let's do that. This one's our most complicated so far. We start from a fresh screen. Um, let's start with the value 10. Remember, we're, we're summing the, the squares of the, well, ultimately we're gonna sum the squares of the integers from one to 10, one to n. Now, we're going to we're going to use an, an index i, and i is going to run from one up to ten. But we're not going to use a for loop. We need to use a while loop. So we need to initialize our loop index. And now we 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 have the statement while i is less than or equal to n. So we're going to start at one and stuff's going to happen up until i reaches the value of n. In this case, n is equal to 10. Terminates with a colon and we're going to do some stuff. And for the moment, our stuff is just going to be to print the value i. This is not a complete solution to the program to the problem, but it's a baby step because it's, it's going to allow us to check that our while loop is operating correctly. But it's but even in that form there, it's got the program's got four lines. We need to add an additional line. It's a point. It's an important point, and it's one I didn't explicitly call out in Monday's lecture. It's an important difference between a for loop and a while loop. The for loop automatically increments the loop index according to the list that's been provided. The while loop does not do that. It's up to us as programmers to explicitly increment the value of the loop counter as we see fit. And in this case, we need to Increment i to the to its next to its to the next value because we're going to loop along from one to two to three to four and so on up to n. So now, if I run that code, we printed the numbers one through n on the console. Okay, all we've done is print them. Our next step, but we, we, ah, but we've done something important. Even though it's it's only a baby step towards the final the final um, problem solution, it's an important one because we've we've initialized the loop variable. We've correctly got the syntax of the while statement correct, and we've uh, manually incremented the loop counter. So it's a baby step, but it's an important one to be able to use a while loop to print the numbers one to 10 to the console. Um, next step, 
let's print not the not the loop variable itself, but the square of the loop variable. Okay, so let's run that now. Excellent. So now we're printing the values of the, the squares, one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, five squared, and so on, up to 10 squared. We're making progress. Remember the problem. Remember the problem. The problem was to calculate the sum of the squares of the first n integers. We've not computed the sum yet, but we have computed the squares. Now we need a way of adding each square as it's calculated. So what we do is, what do we do? It's nice to print it. We need to have a running sum that we'll call sum is equal to sum plus I squared. So on each pass through the while loop, the value of I squared is going to be added to this variable sum, which we call a running variable, a running sum. Now, if we run that program, we get an error. And the reason is that the variable sum has not been defined. It's actually quite a, um, a, a misleading and a unhelpful error, error uh, message. That's common. Um, we look back at our code and think, oh, we're, we're saying sum is assigned the value of sum plus i squared, but sum's never given an initial value. So we need to initialize the running sum to be equal to zero here. Let's run it again now. Great, okay. Ah, we haven't printed the value of sum. Let's see what happens if we print the value of sum inside the loop. Run it again. It's a bit of a mess. Let's comment out this one and run it again. Okay. So now what's getting printed as we pass through each loop is the running sum. So it's, a, it's the sum of the squares up to and including the sum of the current loop variable squared. It's not clear that that was a helpful step. So let's comment out that print statement. But what we can do is when we get to the bottom of that pro, the bottom of the loop is print the running sum here. Let's run this now. So only no only one number's printed. And it's equal to the sum. Beaut. Okay. Now, so we've actually we're actually pretty close to a solution, or at least a, a first complete solution, whether it works or not. Our program uses a while loop tick. We need to demonstrate our program for n equals 10. Have just done that. How do we know that the number 385 is equal to one squared plus two squared plus three squared up to 10 squared? The only way we know is to be able to check our answer with the formula that was given to us. And here it is n times n plus one times two n plus one divided by six. So let's now print, um, let's define a variable Sn is equal to n lots of n plus one, lots of two, lots of n plus one. And we want that all to be divided by six. And then we wanna print Sn. Let's run that. How good's that? The first number that's printed is the sum of the squares of the numbers from one to 10. The second number that's printed is what's called a closed form solution. It's this formula that was given to us as part of the problem specification. 
So we've got a high degree of confidence that our code's right because our iterative solution takes the va same value as the sum of squares. Now I, I'm going to print, I'm going to rearrange this code just a little bit. And print um, something like some messages to the screen that help us understand what's being displayed. So we're going to print this one. So let's run that quickly again. Check where we make one. So the iterative sum is equal to 385. And this one we can. Um, we'll call it a closed form expression. But we call it a formula. Let's run that. Look, and there we're done. We're done. And if I was going to tidy this code up, now the code's written. I can take out my little debugging statements along the way. And if I was really sort of smartening this up for long term, um, long term use, I would provide some comments here. So this is quite a complicated program. Um, it in, it in, in includes a number of features that are in conjunction with one another. Use of the while loop, a problem specification that we might not have seen before, sum of squares, and certainly being given a, a formula that we can compare our answer to. Um, that's pretty handy to be able to to, to write a program that brings all those elements together. And I think it's important for you to see, it's really important actually, it's one of the, the major take home messages that I want you to get from today's lecture, which is that, that for, program, for problems like example six, it's a really good idea to start by, don't try and solve the whole problem at once. Try and think about the first, the simplest possible step that you could take towards a solution test that that works and if it does take the next step if it doesn't scratch your head and start your debugging process at that stage so this this is a coding strategy i'm giving you rather than a you know a syntax of python type of um type of content but coding in small steps often helps in better understanding the problem in some ways writing a computer program is one of the best ways of understanding if you really understand the problem um, but in this in the, in this case we used our step by step, a step by step approach um, to solve a pretty complicated problem. Okay, that is the end of our the first component of today's lecture. In the remaining ten or so minutes, I want to talk a little bit about um, next week's assessed lab. So, um, next week's assessed lab uh, will cover content that we've covered in the course so far. The six dot points that you see on the screen in front of you now are the highlights of the technical content that we've seen in the, the program so in the course so far. So it took us a couple of lectures to get up to speed. There was some introductory material, there was some organisational material, but we really got started at the start of week two. We wrote our first Python program that used an external library function a trigonometric function, remember the ATAN, the arctangent function. We then introduced simple plotting, plotting some curves. Um, we plotted a parabola that came from the trajectory or the, the vertical height of a, of, a, of a soccer ball that was given an initial kick. And we plotted the height as a function of time. We did some, did some simple displaying of numbers to the, to the console using formatted print statements. Um, we didn't focus greatly on that, but um, some of the lab exercises uh, explored the different print formats for both integers, floats, including um, scientific notation format and also strings. Um, we definitely used arrays um, because we 
we solved the problem of tracking the height of the soccer ball using um, arrays for both the time, first one second separated by one millisecond gaps, and also the height of the ball at each of those one millisecond intervals. And then beginning on Monday and followed up with today, we looked at branching and looping. So conditional execution of code and use of for and while statements to, to iterate around, either until a specified number of um, loop iterations has been reached, the for loop, or until a particular condition satisfied with the while loop. So the topics we've covered in the course so far form the basis for the assessed lab in week four. Now, it's unlikely that, that you'll be asked to use all these features in the solution of your assessed lab, but um, you could reasonably expect a subset of them. So a little bit about um, week four, I ex expect that um, the Discord chat in questions lectures will be alive with questions. Um, I'll say a few words and I might get a moment to look in there to see if you've got any questions for me, but I suspect either Sarah or Brenton or both are in there answering your questions. So I wanna set the scene for next week's lab today. So each student um, attends their face-to-face -face lab session. Um, the sessions themselves are two hours long. The lab, the assessed lab itself will only be one hour long. So there's enough time for students to get started and finished well and truly before the, the scheduled two hour slots finished. The lab next week counts towards 5% of your course grade. It's also worth five marks in the lab in the lab sheet. So when you see the questions, you'll see that the marks add up to five. So that 5% and the five marks gives you a way of managing your time in that hour. Um, in saying that, uh, it's unlikely to be the case that each mark in the paper is equally easy. So there will be opportunities for rel relatively easy marks and there will be other material that you've got the time up to an hour to write a short program um, to illustrate your knowledge um, that might take you more time to, to get that mark. So in particular, uh, there was a good question on Discord this week about what's the, what's the nature of the assess lab like? Is it gonna be, um, do I have to memorize things? Do I have to um, um, answer short answer questions or multiple choice or true and false? The answer is no. Um, we try and make the assessment in this course as authentic as possible. And for this assessed lab, that means you writing short programs. Um, not long programs, but uh, writing code. So you'll be expected to boot up PyCharm, open the editor, um, run code, execute code. And when your code meets the problem specification in the question sheet, you shoot your hand up, the tutor comes around, you demonstrate to the, to the tutor that your code works and you're marked on the spot. So you're not filling in bits of paper. Our tutors are not walking away with great stacks of paper. They're assessing you on the spot. And the marking system will be such that it's obvious to you and the tutor on the spot whether your problem, whether your program meets the, meets the specification. So there are two questions in the, in the sheet and the, the sum of the marks for those two questions will add up to five. Now, um, importantly, uh, there'll be a sample paper available in Blackboard shortly. Um, and it's available in the week three course materials for the course. So that is easily your best concrete um, indication of what the quiz will, will look like. Not there yet, but it'll be there, it'll be there shortly. And so you'll get a really concrete idea of what the quiz papers will, will look like. Uh, in saying that, uh, so I'm being clear at, at this point, what are we, Thursday in week three? Here's what the assessed lab in week four will look like using the sample paper that will shortly be available in Blackboard in the, week, in the course materials for week three. That said, there will be variation between the papers that are seen by the different sessions during the week. Um, 
So just because someone's seen a question in week on in Monday doesn't mean the group, the lab groups later in the day and later in the week will see exactly the same questions. There'll be variations. Um, I'm not, I won't say any more than that. Here's the cover sheet. Um, a reasonable question or sequence of questions for you to ask of me and us at this point is um, what are we allowed to use? What are we not allowed to use? So let me put to you what the cover sheet on the paper looks like. Um, it's, it's an open book assessment task. So it's not about getting you to memorize what the for loop statement looks like in Python. It's not about getting you to memorize what the plot statements look like. You've got the ability to bring in lecture slides um, that you've got available. You've got the ability to bring in your code that you've written as solutions for weeks one to three assessment exercises. Um, the, the point is that it's pre-existing material. Um, we do have some prohibitions. Um, it's not an exercise in you texting your mate um, and saying, can you answer this question for me? It's not uh, a, a case of you using uh, Discord to uh, um, groups uh, source a, a solution to your to your problem. So if we look there, there are the specifics of the uh, of the, the the rules around the quiz. The basic principle is really easy. The basic principle is what do you know? Not what your mate knows. What do you know? And no might mean, oh, I've forgotten the syntax, but I know how to use it. I know how to write a for statement, but I've forgotten how to how to use the syntax in, in Python. That's all right. You know where to find the information. So there's no help from the demonstrators in, in answering the questions like they would normally provide. There's no talking to your mate in, at the computer next to you. There's no participation in online forums, such as Discord, for example. It's about what you know on the spot. That said, uh, you've got an hour. Uh, if it takes you the hour to write the programs to answer the questions, um, I, I, we're not expected to demonstrate your code that runs the first time, answers the questions completely. It's a, you've got a, you've got time in the in the session to think. Hang on, um, that's the first attempt at my code. It's not working. I'll start again, or I need to modify it and debug. That's what authentic assessments about, not about choosing a multiple choice uh, answer to a um, to a question. It's can you can what knowledge do you have? What knowledge have you acquired in the last three weeks that you can use to solve the questions? in the two tasks. So we're pressing right up hard against five o'clock. I'll, um, I'll wrap up at this point um, and I'll join you in Discord for questions that you might have um, following. Until, until we next catch up, which I suspect will be on Monday of next week, I'll say bye for now.